Good evening, everyone. The time is now 7 p.m., and that means it is time for another one of our Military Aviation Museum webinars. I'm Keegan Chetwin, the director of the museum, and it's my great privilege to have you all here with us tonight. Thank you so much for your continuing support of our webinar program. Our speaker is Bob Hill. Bob is a 19-year veteran pilot uh, for the Military Aviation Museum. That means Bob has been flying the airplanes in this collection since before the buildings were sitting and were built. Uh, during his tenure at the museum, Bob has flown the museum's PBY. He's also flown the TBM Avenger. Uh, Bob has also flown the B-25, the SNJ-4, and was a pilot on our B-17 Flying Fortress uh, that was a part of the collection previously. Uh, Bob is a 14,000 hour plus pilot and has flown over 120 different types of aircraft during his career. Uh, for many years, he's flown the B-17 as a volunteer ride tour pilot with the Liberty Foundation and has nearly 2,100 hours in three different B-17s. He's also flown the B-25 as a ride tour pilot and has flown seven different B-25s. Uh, Bob holds an airline transport rating in all four classes of aircraft and is also a commercial glider pilot. Uh, he's type rated in 10 large airplanes, including the B-17, the PBY. Um, interestingly, that's not his only flying boat experience. Uh, Bob is also able to fly the CL-215 and CL-415 Canadian water bombers that are frequently used in firefighting, uh, forest fires and so on. He's also got a rating for the DC-3, the DC-4, the Grumman Mallard, the Grumman Albatross, an Avenger, and the B-25 Mitchell. He holds a certified flight instructor rating for a single multi-engine instrument and glider. And with respect to the Catalina, he has flying experience in a Dash 5A, Dash 6A, and a Supercat as well. Uh, Bob resides in the Nashville area and is a, a great person to have the opportunity to talk to. Um, it's, it's such a special experience to go flying with the two Bobs uh, that fly our PBY and to hear from them about the airplane and, and what it's like to, to operate it. And uh, after having the, the opportunity to experience that myself, I was eager to invite Bob here uh, as a webinar presenter to give everyone else the chance uh, to, to hear from him what it's like to fly this airplane, um, what it's like to have all that history, uh, you know, kind of under your control as you, as you lumber into the sky. Uh, nothing on a PBY appears to happen quickly, uh, takeoff included. So, Bob, if, if you can hear us and, and we're good to go, I, I think we're ready to turn it over to you. I can hear you loud and clear. How me, Keegan? Yeah, we've got you. I think we're ready to go. Okay, well, firstly, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us tonight. Um, it's a great opportunity to be able to talk about one of the airplanes at the museum that I've been very fortunate to have been one of the custodians of for the past uh, 19 years, in my case. Um, it's certainly enjoyable. And um, I would say at the outset that uh, this presentation I've put together is about only 36 slides, and I'll talk over the top of each of the slides. And I also have some notes on each slide as well. But it is extremely difficult to begin to compress 78 years of airplane history into a relatively very short time period, let alone talk about the systems of the airplane. If we were to sit and do a ground school, we'd be here eight hours a day for three days at least. So bear with me on that. And I would mention that if you do have specific questions or perhaps something that I haven't mentioned that you would like to know about, please write that down and then um, ask that question. And Keegan will be sure to ask it uh, at the close of the presentation. And I'll do my best to be able to answer it. I'm going to try to speak to the lowest common denominator here. So uh, I know there's a, a varied audience here that's interested in the airplane. I'll start with the first slide here, the Military Aviation Museum PBY Catalina. Uh, PBY, a lot of people may not be familiar that PB stands for Patrol Bomber. And with a Navy airplane, the last letter was always the manufacturer's designated code. In this case, Y was a consolidated airplane. Uh, for example, F was Grumman, so F4F, F6F. F6, F. That was a Grumman airplane, TBM Avenger, General Motors, as opposed to TBF, which was a Grumman airplane. And in this case, we're going to specifically talk and inevitably get to the, the, the Series 5A. Series 5 uh, in the lineage of the PBY, and A stood for the Amphib as opposed to the PBY-5, which was what we call a straight flying boat and did not have any uh, retractable landing gear, if you will. Personally, before we get started, you know, I get various pictures from anywhere, and I don't know where they always come from. People send me things. 
but I am familiar with some of the photographers that have contributed photos um, to many publications, let alone to, to sharing with uh, those of us here at the museum. And I would like to mention specifically uh, these individuals, uh, Rich Colaza, and a lot of his pictures will be presented here in this presentation. And you're looking at one of them right now. It happens to be my favorite picture of the Catalina. Uh, Michael O'Leary, uh, who did we did a photo shoot with at Thunder Over, Michigan in 2011. Uh, some of those photos are here. Hari Yanomoto, another photographer and one of our friends from the Toronto, Canada area. Uwe Glauser, one of our German friends, also has contributed many photos and is just a superior photographer. A gentleman by the name of David Brown. And I'd also like to thank my 19-year co-pilot, Robert Coe. Um, a lot of the pictures here were taken by Bob. Bob constantly takes pictures. Um, and at the museum, and Keegan alluded to this earlier, we, typically we're referred to as Bob Squared, because we're both Bob or sometimes they just call us the Bobs. So I want to, I want to thank Bob uh, for his friendship and also for his contributions for the last 19 years and, and for some of these pictures. And another member of our flight crew is John Bronner. John is a member of the Fighter Factory, which is the restoration maintenance facility. He's an aviation maintenance technician there at the Fighter Factory, and he is the crew chief on the PBY. And he is obviously an active flight crew member. And the three of us, uh, as long as, uh, as well as other individuals at the fighter factory and docents comprise uh, the crew on the airplane. And some of these photos, I don't know where they all came from. So I'll include a cast of many. Uh, if you happen to be one of those photographers and you see a picture that you took and, and your name is not here, please accept my apologies. I just, I'm just not aware of it. So anyway, um, we'll get started here a little bit. Uh, firstly, this is a slide I have from another PowerPoint and some of the airplanes um, that I've been involved with over the years. And I only have this here because I may refer to a couple of these airplanes and specifically I'll use my pointer here over on this side here, we see the, the 415 Candid Air Water Bomber and the, and the 215 here with the R2800s on it. I may refer to those as briefly particularly with respect to hydrodynamic design of the airplane. Um, and I, I may briefly mention the, the three, uh, like freight hauling days and DC-3s, and of course the 17, perhaps, um, in comparing some of these airplanes. It's also important to be aware that of all the, the PBYs I've happened to have flown, no two are restored exactly the same. They're all different in their own modifications, and um, um, and in the restorations, for example, cow flaps, which control volume of air around an engine. Uh, originally, they were manually cable operated on a PBY. I have flown them uh, manually operated. I've also flown them hydraulically actuated, and ours happen to be electrically actuated. So all these restorations are a bit different and, and no two cats are the same. So what we're gonna be showing you tonight and going through the airplane a bit is the, the Military Avi Aviation Museum Catalina. So just keep in mind that they're all very different. That one you see in the upper right-hand corner, for example, um, that was taken in the later 90s. That's on Lake Ponderay. That was the old Bob Franks airplane. Um, and when he passed away, it went to a fellow named Ernie Martin. And then Ernie sold it to Connie Edwards. Um, and I happened to have moved that airplane last June. Um, Connie passed away, of course, in 2019. And I moved the airplane for the new owner. And that's a good example of an airplane that is literally converted to a, a corporate yacht on the inside, for lack of a, a better description. Um, but anyway, um, again, modifications. A, a good example, we, we look at on the right side, a wartime photo of entry into a PBY would be through the left blister. And you see the, the ladder there with the crew member. And if you look over at uh, Thunder Over Michigan over here, where it looks like I'm taking my armpit after a flight, um, you can see our entry door is highly modified. And this is a good example of some of the modi modifications that have occurred to these airplanes over the years. Again, the, the flying yacht mentality where it'd be placed in the water and used uh, literally as a boat to go swimming in this case. So, so you're going to see a lot of these things. Windows on the airplane have been added, things of that nature. 
And it's, const, it's kind of a constant ongoing restoration process. And John Bronner, the crew chief I mentioned earlier, is heavily involved in that. We'll look at some of the pictures he just sent me a couple days ago uh, to, to show you how the airplane is continually evolving. If we look back at the history of the Model 28, and that's what it was called, and there were previous models that the, the Navy used that were built by Consolidated. What, what we've called, the, what we think of as the PBY Catalina is actually the Model 28, and the first version of that was the XP3Y1. It was first flown on March 21st, 1935, and, and Consolidated at that time was still located in Buffalo, New York, and in March, in Buffalo, New York, they couldn't use the Niagara River, so they literally disassembled the airplane and trucked it down to Hampton Roads um, and were able to use Naval Air Station uh, Norfolk, for example, and the seaplane ramps that were there to do the test flying on what we would know as the PBY, the Model 20A. It was very unique in its design for the time, and it is an airplane of its time, and that's important to remember. Uh, but it had some very unique elements that were somewhat firsts in the industry. And if you look at the airplane, it has a pylon mounted wing. The wing actually bolts to two bulkheads um, that are inside that pylon that's fared around it, if you will. And inside that pylon also was the flight engineer of the airplane. The flight engineer position post-war was all those things were taken out of there and moved up forward to the cockpit. But in wartime, and we'll look at some pictures here and a few, few more slides. During the wartime, um, the airplane did have a flight engineer, and he pretty much did everything. The pilots had the throttles and the propeller controls. Uh, the flight engineer did a lot uh, of things with the airplane. It was also one of the first airplanes to have a, a fully cantilevered horizontal stab. And what I mean by that is there's no external bracing struts or wires on it. So it was very clean and airframe design. Also very uniquely, it had electrically actuated wing floats that when retracted formed the wing tips and the under curvature of the outer portion of the wing. And we'll look at some pictures of that here shortly as well. It was also one of the first flying boats to be constructed by what was termed plate and stringer construction. And you can go online and, and find videos of Consolidated and how these airplanes were built. And it's interesting that the first Model 28 flew in 1935 in our airplane, which is serial number 48294, which is a PBY 5A, first flew on October 23rd, 1943. And this is a picture of that logbook entry. We have all the logbooks, save a five-year period from 1956 to 61. They exist, including all the wartime patrols and I was fortunate enough many years ago to make copies of those. And this is one of those copies. So you can see it was a, a, a four hour, you know, and three tenth flight, four hours and 18 minutes, basically. Flight, the initial shakedown at Consolidated. Consolidated was in Buffalo in 1935, but by August of 1935, they were relocated to San Diego, California. If we look at this picture, this is, uh, it's kind of interesting. This is the first uh, experimental PBY 5A, and the, that's at the top. But in reality, it is the last production PBY 4 that the Navy allowed to be fitted with retractable landing gear. And the actual wheel assembly is part of what was known as the beaching gear, and we'll look at that here in a moment. The PBY originally was designed as what we call a straight flying boat, it didn't have landing gear. Landing gear is very much an afterthought in design, and it's something the Navy, by the late 1930s, wanted to see. They could get more utility out of the airplane. Uh, and indeed, if it hadn't been converted to an amphibious airplane, it would not be, we, you would not be seeing them today at air shows, et cetera. The only PBY-5 I have ever seen, a straight boat, is in the, air, is in the uh, Navy Museum in Pensacola. For obvious reasons, they don't exist flying. But it's interesting that the consolidated engineers originally resisted converting the PBY to an AMFIB. And they cited reasons of weight, and these are all logical reasons, internal space. And quite honestly, they admitted they had never worked with hydraulic landing gear. They were flying boat people. They weren't used to landing gear. However, the tests were flown and um, 
The Navy then ordered the airplanes, 33 PBY 5As were ordered in December of 39. And uh, as we see here by 1940, they ordered an additional 134 PBY 5As. Throughout its history, wartime production, 803 PBY 5As were built and about 380 Canzos. And a Canzo was an airplane that would be built by Canadair up in Waterville, Ontario, just uh, in the Montreal area. Um, in the United States, total PBY production of all models was about 3,281, depending on your source. And I think when you look at the Canadian airplanes thrown in, it's around 4,051 uh, total airframes. But you see a little bit of difference there between the, the PBY-4, which had spinners on the propellers, by the way. And of course, our airplane down below was a recent picture from last September at the Arsenal of Democracy. Um, sporting the amphibious landing gear. Now we'll talk about a little bit about that here for the next slides. Uh, I mentioned that the airplane was originally conceived as a straight flying boat designed to operate off of infinite waterway. Uh, you know, if you think of the 1930s, we didn't have a proliferation of airfields and airports at all. Um, they may have been turf, grass strips, and even your commercial airports of the era were usually uh, cinder. Um, Cincinnati International, for example, is famously mentioned in Ernie Gann's Fate as the Hunters as, as a cinder runway that they would land DC-3s on. So flying off an infinite waterway made a lot of sense, and it certainly made a lot of sense to the Navy. However, the airplane was fitted with what was termed a beaching gear, and the airplane could simply be tugged down a ramp into the water, and the beaching gear was removable. And they were just, you can see two mains there. This is the beaching gear. If you look carefully at the hull, you know, in this area, you don't see any landing gear per se. And these attach, and there's a yoke assembly tailwheel, if you will, for lack of a better description, um, at the aft portion or stern of the airplane, since we use nautical terms, um, that could easily be removed. And the, the beaching gear would simply be placed back on the airplane as the, as the airplane taxied back to a ramp and again be tugged up onto the ramp for servicing. Um, this over on this side here is, gives you an idea what the beaching gear looked like. Throughout the PBY's uh, production, they left the facility, the attach points, to place beaching gear on the airplane, even if it was an amphib. And they could use the beaching gear, pull it up on a couple of ramps, and they could do gear swings, you know, with a regular amphibious gear that's installed on the airplane. So it was placed on all the airplanes. And it probably made sense just to keep the production line going, not to be changing that facility on, on certain airplanes that had that uh, were amphibious and those that weren't. Um, also, the beaching gear could swivel. It was a lock, you could swivel the gears so they could make turns that way if they wanted to, et cetera. Also, if you look at this wartime photo, you'll see that the, the wing floats are actually tied down to beaching gear. I don't know if that would actually hold the airplane, but they did tie it down to beat. It looks like beaching gear holding it. And if you look on the under curvature of the wing, you'll see external ordnance. External ordnance was carried under the PBY wings and each side could carry up to 2,000 pounds. A Mark 12 torpedo was 2,000 pounds, or they'd carry uh, you know, one torpedo, two 1,000 pound bombs on the other side, or four 1,000 pound, pound bombs, et cetera, depending on how the airplane was being utilized. In the South Pacific, for example, the, the famous Black Cats would carry torpedoes and or 1,000 pound bombs typically to attack uh, Japanese shipping. Here, what we see depicted is depth charge bomb racks under the wings. And the depth charge bomb was probably weighed in the area of a little over 300 pounds, as I recall. Um, and this would have been how our airplane would have been fitted during wartime. And uh, it just gives you an idea of how that was uh, achieved externally on the airframe. I'll move on here. Our airplane again flew October 23rd, 43, and we see another test flight here on November 16th. And by November 19th, we see a flight for 19 hours and, and two tenths, 19 hours and 12 minutes to San, direct from San Diego to Norfolk, Virginia. And of course, it went to Naval Air Station Norfolk, which is now Chambers Field. And that's where the airplane 
inevitably uh, would be fitted with its uh, depth charge bomb racks, et cetera. They formed a VPB-92, and this airplane was part of VP-92, and um, would inevitably leave and go to Agadir, French Morocco. Um, and we see the flight here. It took the southern route from what we can see. And if we look in the notes here, over here, we can see it stopped in San Juan, Puerto Rico, and it's had its accumulator service pre-charged to 650 pounds. Um, and that's kind of interesting. So it went with its crew, with Lieutenant Chalmers here, um, over to French Morocco. The airplane flew out of Agadir, um, Port Luwedi, and uh, Casablanca were typical uh, places where the airplane would fly. And it would fly the Straits of Gibraltar and conduct U-boat patrols with those depth, depth charge bombs you saw on the under curvature of each wing. Um, it, it would also fly out to the Canary Islands and then the Azores. We have all the logbooks showing all these patrols. Uh, then the airplane inevitably would move to uh, Trinidad in the, in the South Atlantic and uh, fly uh, patrols there in the South Atlantic and the Caribbean, again, looking for U-boats. And then in its Navy history, it, 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 during wartime, it went up to Rhode Island and patrolled the Eastern shipping lanes um, from Rhode Island. And then post-war, the airplane would uh, serve a brief stint, maybe six months or so, with the Coast Guard at Elizabeth City, again, not too far from the museum. And then it would be handed back to the Navy. And uh, it kind of bounced around in the Navy, Alameda, Seattle, North Island, et cetera, until 1953, when it was placed in storage. Um, we know the airplane was sold in 1956, specifically August 27, uh, 1956. The airplane was sold civilian. And that's where the whereabouts get unknown for about five years. Uh, then in 1961, it kind of reappears as being sold in Miami to an individual in Little Rock, Arkansas. And then uh, the airplane was sent to New Orleans for some modifications. Uh, they installed a clipper bow, which we'll see here shortly. <clears throat> and again, they removed the blisters and some of the other things that they do to modify airplanes. Um, it would be sold again by the late 70s. It was, it was actually a fuel hauler in Alaska which is not uncommon up there. And then most interestingly, it was sold to a Colombian concern in the late 70s, it was used to haul drugs. Um, it was seized by the DEA in 1985 in Florida. And then the government sold the airplane in 1986 to an individual in uh, California. And then restoration was started there. And this would have been the late 80s, early 90s now. And it was a company called Aerocrafters at, at Santa Rosa. I know those guys. Uh, in 95, that individual sold the airplane that ended up in Italy. Uh, it was then sold to a fellow in South Africa. And then from there, it was flown to North Weald, England, and then once again placed for sale. And then it was sold to the Military Aviation Museum in 2001. So again, a long and, and lengthy history, and of course, rather difficult to, to taste. If we look at the airplane here, we'll talk a little bit about um, some facts and we'll get into systems just to kind of generally. Um, but this is a great picture showing a couple of things to me that are relatively noticeable. First, I'll talk about the wing. It's a 104 foot wingspan with the, with the wing floats retracted. If I extend the wing floats, uh, the wingspan is 100 feet. The fuselage is 63 feet, 10 and 7 16 inches long. The tail is about 21 feet, one inch high. Um, the hull is 10 feet, two and a half inches at its widest point. And the highest portion of the airplane is inside the flight engineer tower, what's what we call compartment D. It's eight feet, four inches high in there. <laughs> um, I mentioned earlier, and we'll look at the wing floats, but they are electrically or manually actuated. They can be hand cranked up or down as well. Um, if they're actuated electrically, they tend to extend at 28 and a half volts. So they'll, they'll take 25 seconds to either extend or retract. They do have a limiting speed on the floats of 125 knots, which is generally not a problem unless you're, you know, uh, descending, if you will. Um, 
The one of the most interesting things here in this design, if you look at the center pylon, and that's where the wing mounts, this is called the pylon area here. And this is where the flight engineer resided during wartime. And he had a window on each side. You can all see the sliding windows that slide up and down. Um, if we if we look at this area here, this is where the wing is supported. And that was very, very unique design for its time. And that actually supports the wing in concert with these four lift struts. And that's it. But what's most interesting here is look at the angle. And if you can discern this, this wing is at a six degree angle of incidence. This horizontal stabilizer is at a four degree angle of incidence on the ground. The engines with respect to the six degree wing incidence are at a negative three or a plus three, depending on how you want to look at that. So the engines are actually canted down negative three degrees from the wing. And that speaks volumes about its hydrodynamic design as well. Because if we go back to, and I'll pick on the, the Canadair boats, if we go back to the Canadairs, um, the Canadair boats, uh, wing incidence, this is six degrees, and Canadair is two degrees. The incidence of the horizontal stabilizer on a PBY is four degrees. On a Canadair, it is zero degrees. And if we look at, and this is the, the PBY was in Britain, uh, again, highly modified, tell by looking at the blisters and the windows, et cetera. Um, but if you look at just the PBY sitting in, in this case, it's a slow taxi, but in displacement mode, if you will, and if the engines are running, you're always moving forward. There's no brakes on the water. Um, look how flat the airplane sits in the water. So the mentality of the day was to lift the airplane hydrodynamically and aerodynamically by using this large angle of incidence on the wing and on the horizontal stab to literally levitate and aid the airplane in getting out of the water. A Canadair, for example, will sit in the water at a trim angle of three degrees. And if you visualize, and you can try to find that, a picture of a Canadair sitting in the water in displacement mode or something, I should have put one in here. But if you just visualize some of the boats, you know, the bow is raked up the trim, we call that the trim angle, the angle between the, the hull and the water. The, that trim angle is kind of great, you know, the stern sits low and, the, and the, the bow sits high. I think you can all visualize that with a boat. And that's how a modern flying boat design is. So they use hydrodynamic lift as well as aerodynamic lift <clears throat> to place and, and allow the airplane to come out of the water for flight. Um, the PBY, you can see, really did not have too great hydrodynamic lift. Matter of fact, comparatively speaking, the PBY is, is not the best handling airplane on the water. Also, if you look at the wing floats here, they are literally designed to just keep the wingtip from entering the water. They are structural, and you can actually cause damage, um, you know, if you were to... Um, you can cause structural damage if you were to damage the uh, either the braces or the underside of the wing, which forms the main structural component of the float. Um, where a modern, I'll even pick on the Albatross, which is a 1946 design, or the Mallard, certainly the Canadairs, all those floats are what we call breakaway. They will shear off the airplane if too much of a load is imposed on those floats. Not true with the PBY. You will actually cause structural damage to the wing. So again, <clears throat> on the water here, if you're up on what we call the step, like planing on a boat, if you will, um, you have to make very, very flat turns. You keep the wings level for the most part. So it's something you just want to be conscious of in the PBY. And comparatively speaking, you know, not the best of designs, although for its time, it was very much ahead of its time. Again, we'll, uh, this is a good shot of the forward shot of the airplane that somebody took. We'll look at the power plants on the airplane. We do have Pratt and Whitney 1830-92s. They develop 1200 horsepower at departure power settings. Uh, for any pilots that are there at, at, at ISA, that's 47 inches at uh, 2700 RPM, excuse me, 48 inches at 2700 RPM. Um, also, we have uh, two 28-volt, uh, 200 amp generators on each engine to supply electrical power. Typically, we those engines, and they're the same engines that are used on a DC-3, a C-47, by the way, at the 1830-92, all the same power settings, 
same performance, everything is the same. Um, flight plan, generally speaking, 100 gallons an hour uh, as a general rule uh, for the airplane. We'll talk a little bit about fuel here in a second. Uh, we can see the gear track there. It's about 16 feet, nine inches between the wheel centers. That's important to always know that in your airplane so you can fit on most taxiways wherever you happen to be. The nose wheel on this airplane, uh, again, the gear is an afterthought on a PBY, but the nose wheel casters plus or minus 30 degrees. It's a castering nose wheel. Uh, the main wheels that we see, those tires are the same as a B25, so you can share tires with a B25. It's a 47-inch main wheel. Uh, the only hydraulics you have on the airplane, there are three hydraulic appliances, and it's the three landing gear, the brakes, and the nose wheel gear doors that you see. And these gear doors, well, you can almost make it out. They are locked by two telescoping pins that protrude out of an actuating sequence valve that's located on bulkhead number one right up in here. And they're oh, probably quarter inch, three eighths inch diameter steel, stainless steel pins that literally extend, they actuate out of the valve and go into little sockets, little holes here in the leading edge of the gear doors. You can almost see it there. There's, there's holes right here. There's one in each door. And that's all that holds those doors closed on the water. And that ha historically has been a problem. It was a problem for the Navy operating the airplane. And it was a problem in civilian usage as well. The last accident I can think of was a tanker circa 96, 97 on a reservoir that started porpoising and it came down on the nose gear doors and literally imploded the whole hull. The nose gear doors split open because all you have holding them closed are those two pins and um, literally blew the hull right apart, ejected both pilots out. The, the left engine came swinging through the cockpit and how, how, how that missed everybody, I don't know. But it's been a problem for a long time and that's one of the gotchas in the airplane, literally. There's been some major accidents with those gear doors. And uh, generally a good rule of thumb in the cat landing on the water. Again, you have to remember that the Landing gear on, a, on this airplane is an afterthought. It wasn't originally designed this way. Um, but a good rule of thumb is, you know, 78 knots over the fence, if you will, VRAF over the water carrying power. And you want to touch down, or, you know, between 73 and 75 max indicated onto the water with a little bit of power. Um, any, anything faster than that, you're getting up on the gear doors. You're moving the center of buoyancy more forward and you risk, of course, you know, uh, imploding the gear doors open just from impact water pressure, ram air or correction, ram water pressure, not air pressure. Um, so that's something you always have to be very, very mindful in the airplane. This is a good shot of the airplane at Chambers Field. I don't know who exactly took this. I think it's David Brown, um, but it's a it's an excellent view. Uh, of the size of the wing on the airplane. It's 1,400 square foot of wing, and you've got 20 foot of aileron on each side. You see how large the ailerons are. Also in this uh, view, we can easily see how close the engines are actually mounted to the longitudinal axis of the airplane, very close together. Sometimes, depending if you have an engine malfunction, because they are rel relatively close together, it can be more difficult to discern a loss of power on one than another, depending how in tune you are with the airplane. Um, certainly it's easier if you visualize a B-17 and you have a problem with an outboard engine, for example, it's very easily discerned just because of that longer moment arm as well. Originally, the PBY and this, this section here, this whole center section, and these are the outer wing panels where you see these fairings here where they attach. These are the outer wing panels. The outer wing panels, interestingly, um, have a sweep back here of nearly three degrees. It's two degrees, 58 minutes, so about three degrees. And they actually have a little bit of dihedral, two degrees, 20 minutes dihedral. And what I find interesting about that is it's very close to a modern light airplane. Uh, for example, a Cessna, you know, three degree sweep back, three degree dihedral, that, that type of thing. Where if you look at other airplanes of the era in 1934, 35, I'll pick on the DC-3, uh, a sweep back of 15 and a half degrees. Uh, the B-17, you know, eight degrees, nine minutes. So it's an eight degree sweep back, so to speak. This is only a sweep back of nearly three degrees. 
which approximates a more modern light airplane, most interestingly. And of course, sweep bag provides, for those that don't know, an, an inherent lateral stability about the longitudinal axis of an airplane. Uh, and it has to do, with, in this case, with adverse yaw um, due to the size of these ailerons, for example. Uh, and also, if we look at the upper curvature of this wing, these two little rectangular areas you see right here, these are the integral wing tanks. This was also very unique for its time and design because most of the wing tanks were external in flying boats prior to the PBY. Uh, each tank here holds 875 gallons, so we got 1,750 usable gallons, available gallons here, 10,500 pounds if you were to fill them up. And they are set up literally tank to engine. So right tank, right engine, and left tank, left engine, or we can run both engines from both tanks on a fuel selector valve, which is what we typically do because they, they tend to drain more evenly on each side. It keeps them more level depending on how each carburetor is flow. They may flow a little bit differently depending on how they're set up. Also, if we look at the center section of the airplane here, this whole area here on a wartime PBY and on a couple of restorations I have flown was originally fabric covered. Um, I have flown them fabric covered here. A lot of the PBYs post-war were metalized. In other words, aluminum, stressed aluminum skin, just like the rest of the airplane was placed here and on the under, under curvature of the wing as well, as opposed to the fabric. Fabric, uh, you know, the control surfaces are fabric, the ailerons, the rudder, the elevators are all fabric. Fabric was easy to repair. And if you had combat damage, either from flak or from fighters in this case, um, it did not, if, if those were damaged, it didn't necessarily compromise controllability of the airplane. Bullets or flak would tend to rip holes in it and pass through it, as, a, as opposed to splaying metal, if you will, which might compromise your controllability, and they were easily repaired. Um, the PBY, interestingly enough, never had flaps. I've always had people ask me this or mention when I mentioned that it doesn't have flaps, that, well, they used to, right? <laughs> it's like, no, they never did. A PBY never had flaps. Keep in mind, it initially was a straight flying boat designed to take off the land on infinite waterway. Uh, it wasn't designed initially for runways, so it never had flaps. And quite honestly, it'd be nice to have them for various reasons, but um, really not needed in, in the way the airplane is operated. Um, it would be nice to put some drag on the airplane with flaps just to minimize things and I'm getting into some pilot power plant management concepts now, you know, managing radial engines with respect to reverse bearing loads on master rod bearings and things of that nature, but carrying power on engines, it would be a little bit more helpful. Um, I think that's about it on this slide. Let me move on to the next here. Another good shot. This is definitely a Rich Colaza picture. I know when this was taken. And a lot of these photos are actually in a book uh, that I'll mention. It's one of those squadron signal publication books by David Doyle. Uh, it's the PBY Catalina 5A walk-around book. And I know the museum gift shop carried it, and they probably still do, um, if it's still available. But a lot of these photos um, are in that uh, particular book. There's a lot of museum uh, museum. Uh, this airplane from the museum in that book, uh, showing different elements of the PBY. Again, here, if we look very carefully, we can see those two fuel tanks I just mentioned here. And I'll, I'll kind of start at the bow a little bit up here. Um, this is a mooring post. Uh, PBYs can taxi up to a moor, a uh, buoy, if you will, and tie itself off in a harbor. Um, so they had a mooring post, they could put a line around that, for example. Of course, we see the original turret we had on the airplane. This has been replaced with what we call the eyeball turret. We still have this turret. Um, and you'll also notice probably too, the different paint schemes. Uh, this is the earlier paint scheme. Um, this photo was actually taken around 2007. I recall it was a Reading Air Show actually, we did a photo shoot. Um, and then the airplane was repainted uh, several years later into the scheme that you see now. Uh, also here we see, the hatch or door for the anchor in the airplane. We have a couple of chine rails here. We can see a handhold for handling the airplane in the water. And you can see a cleat 
for tying the airplane off. So there are a lot of different nautical appliances on the airplane as well. If we look at the cockpit area, and there I am looking at you, um, these hatches here slide aft, and that is an egress point for the airplane. So we can open those up. Generally, you don't open them um, in flight. Uh, it, it has a, even starting the engines, it, it literally wants to pull your hat and your headset off your head, um, just from the low pressure area from the propellers there. Um, again, here's that pylon we talked about, the leading edge of that, where the flight engineer resided in wartime. And this here is a little step to literally pull yourself up with these two handles under the upper curvature of the wing. A lot of the pre-flight is done up on the upper side of the wing here as well. These here are fuel vents that you see, and the fuel caps for each of these tanks are located right here. Those little areas there that you see. We can see that the exhaust obviously is on the upper portion of the engine cells here. It's a, like a six segment collector ring for all the cylinders. We have two rows of seven cylinders on an 1830. So 14 cylinders total, they all collect and uh, the exhaust is here. There are water drain nipples at the bottom of these exhausts. So water will drain out, although we do place covers on them as well. Also here, if you look at the upper portion of this nacelle, the aft portion right there on each side, this is where the oil tanks reside. And most interestingly, um, <laughs> the, the quantity of oil that the Navy would service, to, service it to would be 65 gallons per side. That's gallons per side. It also has an 11 gallon foam space because the, the, when the oil sloshes around an airplane, it also foams. And there, ha there has to be a, an expansion space for that. It also expands with heat a bit too. Um, so it's actually a 76 gallon capacity, if you will. We're not gonna do 22 hour patrols and, and worry about oil. These are the same engines that are in a DC-3. Uh, a DC-3 is 26 gallons a side, and we service these between 25 and 30 gallons. Really, that's all that's needed. Uh, it's not like we're gonna be out over the Pacific Ocean. Uh, but you do have that capacity uh, to place 65 gallons you know, per side of oil. Uh, this airplane's also been modified with two uh, pedostatic uh, pedo tubes and pedostatic ports around the tubes as well. Um, in wartime, you only had one on the left side, but we have redundant systems. So we, we each have one, we each have an airspeed indicator in the airplane. Oh, let's see, again, there's our uh, unique entry door with a couple of, I call them strakes, aerodynamically they would be strakes. They certainly are handy um, when you climb up onto the airplane for footing. Uh, I usually put one foot here and then one foot here, et cetera. Um, you know, inevitably getting up in this area and climbing up onto the wing. This right here is a, the navigator radio area compartment here. This is a, an escape hatch here. Um, maybe jokingly referred to like a DC-3 as a hamburger door. Um, the hamburger door on a three is on the side near the propeller. This one's on the upper portion of the fuselage, but it's still very close to the propeller. Uh, let's see. I mentioned the early bow turret, the hatches. Uh, we'll move around here. Oh, yeah, the hoist attach points. Uh, during wartime, of course, seaplanes, particularly the, the non amphibs, the straight flying boats, would be hoist up onto seaplane tenders, uh, ships, literally, that had platforms on them to service airplanes. And they had two attach points here, right here, and they'd have a yoke assembly that would attach and they could hoist the airplane out of the water. You can see the two attach points here. These actually run all the way down to the keel. Um, as I recall, and someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but the maintenance and erection manual, for some reason, I recall maximum weight to lift had to be 21,000 pounds, nothing greater than that. So if you had a super cat, for example, most of the super cats empty weights were 22,000 and above. Um, so they were literally unusable at that point um, for a super cat in more modern times. Not that you'd want to do that. Uh, and here's, a, here's a good uh, view of the float and the understructure of the wing. And you can see how the uh, V struts go over center here. These do not lock down. They simply uh, extend to over center and are held down because of this portion here being over center. 
they when they retract, they do lock up. There's a couple of locking poles right here, spring actuated locking poles that hold the floats in the retracted position. And that's one of the things you check on a pre-flight um, to make sure that they're locked. You don't want them, and they will, if they're unlocked, they will flop around out there. You know, they kind of bang up and down off the wing. You don't want to, you know, create any damage, so to speak. I mentioned before, they're not breakaway, they are structural. Um, so that can be a bit of a problem there. When they are extended like this, and I think this picture was taken at Reading too, but I'm not sure, um, they very much compromise uh, aileron authority to one. It's incredibly noticeable. And they rob the airplane of forward speed somewhere in the neighborhood of seven to 10 knots, depending on your power settings. Uh, at an air show, one has to, if, if you're doing any type of maneuvering with the floats extended and relatively steep turns, for example, at low altitude, one has to be very, very cognizant that you're, of the amount of speed that you're dissipating in a turn. Um, you know, you can, you can enter at a, a cruise of, of, you know, 115 and, and roll it into a given bank angle. And the next thing you notice is you're, you know, you're at 80 or less. So one has to be very, very careful, particularly if you're preserving altitude and increasing angle of attack and steep turn. Again, the landing gear is an afterthought. We talked a little bit about the hazard on the water with these nose gear doors, and you can see they're fairly well aft. Ideally, when you touch down, you want to touch down this last, you know, 14, 15 inches of hull right in here, but about 73 knots indicated, ideally. Uh, let's see here. Uh, the gear, I'll uh, go back to that. The gear is locked up and locked down, all three gear, both mains and the nose wheel. And again, they're hydraulically actuated. And these nose gear doors right here are also hydraulically actuated. And again, locked with those two pins we talked about that extend out of an actuating valve. I think I mentioned the speed on the floats. Limiting speed was 125 knots. 25 seconds to operate up or down at 20 and a half volts. Again, electrically actuated. The empty weight of our CAD is about 20,196 pounds. Per the type certificate data sheet with the turret installed, whether it's the old style turret that we see here or the newer style eyeball turret, which is what it had in the wartime, um, the max takeoff weight is 27,000 pounds. So that gives us basically 6804 useful load, um, total useful load in the airplane. If we were to remove one of these turrets and fare the bow over, like you saw in the British airplane that was in the water, that, that's what we call the clipper bow. And obviously it's enhanced single engine aerodynamics should you have a problem. And because you have enhanced single engine aerodynamics, you're able to raise the gross weight of the airplane up to 27,880. So another 880 pounds if you, if you get rid of the turret. Um, of course, we don't want to do that. You know, we, we'd rather have the weight sacrifice. In wartime, in World War II, the Navy operated the airplane at 34,000 pounds. Max takeoff weight. But civilian-wise, we're not allowed to do that. Our, our max takeoff weight is 27,000, but turret 27,880. If you don't have a turret, the Super Cat's a bit higher, 32,000 pounds. I mentioned the flight engineers panel in World War II, and here's a picture of one. I, I literally had a I've never actually seen one in a PBY, and I'm sure in the Navy Museum it exists, but everything that he had during wartime here has been moved up front, so we do it all. Um, I do see a fuel selector valve here, for example. Here are the mixture controls in an our airplane. Uh, the mixture controls are located here. This is kind of between our heads and behind us. And again, we have the fuel selector valves located on this bulkhead as well behind us. Uh, you might kind of make out a bit of a pilot's electrical panel here, generator switches, et cetera. Lights are here, the battery master switches on this panel. Um, there's a cross feed valve here. Uh, cross feed, uh, this opens a cross feed valve, this handle is not the valve. We have alternate air here for carburetor air. Um, but everything that was there during the wartime has been moved forward. And here's a good example of the manual cow flaps. They were literally cranked open with cables. Um, I've flown one PBY where these were moved up front, again, on this bulkhead behind your head. Uh, but most airplanes, other than that one, 
uh, they're either hydraulically actuated, not unlike a DC-3, or they're electrically actuated. Most of them are, are electric that I've been in, um, including Connie Edwards' airplane there that I mentioned earlier, again, electrically actuated. Pre-flight of the airplane can take some time. This is uh, taken last September at the Arsenal of Democracy. Um, and that's John Bronner over behind the right engine there. And just by the picture, I can tell he's removing um, uh, the intake bird bungs that we have in there. He's pulling those out. Um, and uh, I'm over at the wing. I'm doing the upper portion of the pre-flight here. Uh, I'm over to the wingtip. I can tell you what I'm doing. Um, you know, and it looks like I'm about to defile the museum Spitfire down below me, but I assure you, I'm actually putting my weight and kind of bouncing. I'm not jumping up and down, but just forcing my weight onto the outer portion of the wing here in an attempt to see if this float is unlocked. I can, I can move my weight down and it'll flop. So I'm just ensuring that the wing float is in a locked position. Um, the PBY generally, you can kind of divide its pre-flight into three different areas. Uh, we, we generally go inside first. We'll do things like hook up batteries. And, and one of us, uh, generally Bob, uh, Robert, will uh, take an electrohydraulic pump that's in the airplane and uh, pressurize the hydraulic system up to uh, about 1,000 PSI. And I'll go up in the upper portion of the wing and I'll check the uh, hydraulic fluid up there, and I'll show you that in a second. And then I'll stick fuel, check oil, and then just a general overview of the upper, you know, curvature of the wing, control surface, hinge points, et cetera. And then we, we come down, and both of us sometimes we go around the bottom together and doing, uh, you know, bottom external hull pre-flight, if you will, landing gear, et cetera, around the bottom side. So we kind of divide it into those three little sections, if you will. We just know what to do. We kind of flow it. Um, after all these years, uh, there's a lot of things to look at. And it can literally, if we haven't been near the airplane in a little bit, it can take us a couple hours to do all this. Um, hydraulics. Uh, here's a good shot at Thunder, or Thunder or Arsenal Democracy, rather, um, of the upper portion of the wing. And the hydraulics literally are serviced right here. We have a, a PESCO pump that's on the right engine only. So if you have a right engine malfunction, you have to shut down the right engine. You have a couple other alternatives for hydraulics to, to extend the gear and to have braking action. And that would be an electrohydraulic pump that's installed in the airplane. And we also have a hand pump as well. But the hydraulics are serviced under this panel. And we typically, here is the reservoir right over here. It's, it's the whole system holds 10 gallons of 5606 hydraulic fluid. That reservoir, capacity is 3.8 gallons. It's normally serviced to about 2.3 gallons total. There's a minimum gallons of what, uh, 1.7. Uh, we have a little wooden stick we check it with that's here. A lot of the PBYs actually have a sounding rod, kind of like the oil that's attached to that cap, and, that, and that's how you check it. And the minimum would be, if you had a full mark on the sounding rod, it's about three inches below the full mark would be your minimum uh, hydraulic fluid capacity. So this is one of the things that's always serviced. We service and check it with a proper pre-charge of 600 PSI in the accumulators, um, and then at about 1,000 PSI nominal system pressure, uh, we check the fluid quantity. System pressure in the airplane is relatively low by today's standards. A typical modern airplane, and I'm not talking Cessnas, I'm talking, I'll pick on a Canada Air, but even a 737, 3,000 PSI is a normal system. Wartime, you know, was nowhere near that. This system is 850 plus or minus 50 to 1,050 plus or minus 50. Relatively simple system, but it's an archaic system. Uh, it does have, I mentioned, the backup electric pump, which we can use for ground servicing or, or for emergencies as well. And we also have the hand pump that performs the same function. There is a provision, it's incredibly archaic, to do a manual gear extension, and it takes an incredibly long time if you have to do it. It's rather arduous. I won't get into it here. You can maybe find that stuff online, certainly in a manual, but it is uh, arduous to say the least. It's even arduous to train it. Uh, this is a good picture. This is, this is Robert took this, Robert Coe. Um, 
This is this is the oil cap where I showed you on the nacelle. You can see it's a 65 gallons. There's an 11 gallon foam space above that. But most interestingly, it's checked with a sounding rod. You know, did stay for lack of a better term, but sounding rod in the Navy parlance, if you will. And we keep it at 25, 30 gallons, uh, which is literally the same as a DC-3. Same engines. Here's a good shot of the instrument panel of our PBY. As I mentioned, all of these can be greatly different. This electrical panel that you see here is depicted right here. Engine starters are outboard, you know, followed by primers, boost pumps. You see the electric cow flap switch there, the wing float switch, et cetera, landing lights, uh, the emergency elect electric pump. We And you can see these are unguarded in this picture. You can see this airplane here, I can tell you, is poised for starting. These are unguarded. Uh, we've, we've done a complete pre-flight to the point where this airplane's ready to start. So this is how it would be set if we were doing an air show, for example, and getting ready to go. We could hop in the seats, join, you know, rejoin the checklist at a certain point, and this thing is right up to engine start. Uh, but this unguarded switch here is the electrohydraulic pump, which we leave unguarded for starting, taxi, and landing as well, uh, in case we need it. And again, everything's been moved around, you know, from a wartime configuration. We do have fire bottles things of that nature. Uh, rudder pedals down here, these are all original. The yoke assembly here, all the way across that moves is all original. These yokes are, are control wheels and Navy parlance are original. Here's the throttles cabled overhead. And here's your propeller controls here. The mixtures are behind us on a bulkhead. Um, all original here. Uh, most flying boats are cabled overhead as you see here. Uh, the only flying boats I've ever flown that are not, and they're in a normal position where you see in most airplanes, you know, down between the seats and the center quadrant, are the Canada Air water bombers, either the turbine or the, the reset with the R2800s. They're not cabled overhead. But the Albatross, the Mallard, all those are cabled overhead. Uh, let's see here. Um, this is kind of the view from my seat. This is, I remember this was descending into uh, Monroe, North Carolina for an air show. I took that picture. And this is kind of what I see. There's the, the eyeball turret. You can see that portion here sticking up above my Gatorade. Um, here's a view of Virginia Beach coming home, if you will, from somewhere up north, maybe Jones Beach. I can't remember what show we did, American Air Fire Museum up there. And John Bronner took this picture of it going to the Arsenal Democracy just recently. And it goes to show you that the PBY does go fast, and it's not going downhill, it's level. Well, we do go faster than 90 knots about 116 knots indicated. And that's typical at a nominal cruise power setting of 28 inches and 2050 RPM. Um, and an 1830-92 in this case, you're always cruising at 2050 RPM. It's, it's a nominal cruise RPM setting. Climb, descend may be different, but uh, you're always cruising at that setting. And you always cruise a radial at 50% or less of its rated power, whatever that setting would be for a given altitude. Most people probably wonder what it looks like in flight if you're back in the blisters. And here, here's a good example. Um, I can tell you most of these were taken by Rich Colazzo with the exception of this picture here. Um, this was Millville, New Jersey Air Show, if I remember right. I know this is Thunder Over, Michigan. Uh, and I, we, are, we are poised for departure here. Uh, we were part of a 14 airplane Navy Heritage flight here. This is in the Virginia Beach area here. But it gives you an idea of what, what the view looks like out of a blister. This was taken in 03, uh, and that's a super cat over there. And we we're kind of flying together um, at the time, um, which was kind of fun for the event we were at. So we'll move on here. That's just so you can see what it looked like. Everyone called it in the Navy the P boat, and it was uh, always referred to by the pilots as the pig boat. Um, the reason being, it, it doesn't, it's not well harmonized about all three axes of control. Um, if you are a pilot, you would find it um, lightest in pitch, 
you would find it relatively heavy in roll, but keep in mind that it has a 1400 square foot wing that's moving relatively slowly through the air. And that wing, when you go to roll it to a given bank angle to turn, it presents a large dampening moment, you know, resistance to the wind is rolling against that relative wind, if you will. Um, it is incredibly heavy about the vertical axis, yawing the airplane with rudder pedal. So the control inputs are all different. And I, I literally joke, and anyone that's been, has flown this airplane can tell you, um, you know, I, if we do a steep turn in the airplane, I, I jokingly say, if you need to put two feet on a rudder pedal to push, go ahead. In other words, it needs a lot of rudder input. It suffers from a lot of adverse yaw from those large ailerons that the deflected down aileron, if you will, creating lift and raising a wing also creates induced drag and retards the forward speed of that wing and you have to crack for it with rudder pedal. Um, so it's very, very arduous and cumbersome to fly the airplane. Um, and a lot of these characteristics were modified uh, with the 6A, with the taller tail, if you can, you can look at our pictures of those airplanes, and the, certainly the Super Cat, the same. Of course, the Super Cat was re-engined as well with B-25 engines, R-2600s, so it had an additional 1,000 horsepower at departure power settings. Um, but most interestingly enough, and I'll, I'll, two comments always stick in my mind from two museum pilots who I have a lot of respect for. Um, and one of those guys asked me back to a circuit 2003, you know, can, can I go up with you and fly the PBY? And, and he's a Korean War combat veteran who flew our Corsair. And much respect and admiration for this gentleman. But um, when we got done, I said, his name, we call him Obi. I said, Obi, how'd you like the flight? And he goes, well, I never need to fly this again. And that's kind of how it is. Um, our B-25 pilot, John Ferguson, got out of the airplane and literally looked at Bob and I and said, I think this is the hardest airplane I've ever had to fly. So there's always those kinds of comments. And most people that get in it really aren't interested in flying it for that reason. But I think that's part of its charm. And, and certainly from a pilot's perspective, that's part of the challenge, you know, to be able to fly the airplane right, if you will. So um, I very much enjoy the airplane. I love the airplane, actually. Um, but that's part of the challenge. And I enjoy that challenge with the airplane. Uh, again, uh, just just some things for the, for the pilots out there. But when the gear is extended, um, it's noticeably uh, nose heavy and requires up trim. And if you open the cow flaps, it's noticeably heavy and again a little bit of up trim. And the trim is incredibly effective in this airplane. Uh, the wing floats, as I mentioned earlier, if they're extended, it reduces your forward speed by about seven to ten knots if you're level and very much compromises aileron authority. Um, that's probably the most disturbing thing. Uh, I mentioned steep turns, um, particularly with the wing floats extended, it can get you dangerously, dangerously close to the critical angle of attack if you're preserving altitude in a steep turn and not paying strict attention. Um, and you can land with the wing floats extended on land. That's not uncommon. Uh, we don't, uh, need to do that, but it was done routinely in a Supercat, for example, to just to put more drag on the airplane so you, in an effort to minimize reverse bearing loads on the master rod bearing since you had to pull the power so far back. Um, let's see, single en engine operations. There's the left engine caged over there, for example. Um, you know, again, it's nose heavy and you will require rudder trim. You can only hold it for a relatively short period of time before you have to dial in some trim. Very heavy about the vertical axis. Your, your leg will start shaking. Um, it, it takes that much pressure. Stalls in the airplane are very straightforward. They're just slightly, uh, a slight buffet, you know, on the horizontal stab. The instrument panel starts to shake in the onset of the stall and, and really there's no appreciable loss of any lateral or directional control with the airplane. It's uh, well behaved in that respect. A stall speed, if you're at 27,000 pounds and you've got the gear and the floats down, it it's generally stalls about 58 knots. And if the gear and the floats are retracted, uh, 55 knots, just a three knot difference. Relatively clean airframe in some respects. It will accelerate pretty rapidly downhill as well. And because of that, you have to be mindful in power plant management and shock cooling cylinders, things of that nature with cow flaps. 
I'm going to run through the airplane real quick with some pictures that uh, John Bronner took so you can see the interior of the airplane. And we'll go through it from bow to stern, if you will, front to back. And uh, in wartime, depending on where the airplane was operated, it generally served uh, 10 crew members, perhaps seven crew members in the South Pacific, for example. In the South Pacific with the Black Cats, uh, all the, uh, the ability to uh, release ordnance was uh, hooked up in the pilot's compartment. So the pilots did all that stuff. So they didn't have any, any kind of bombardier, bomb aimer type thing, which is when they went for U-boat patrol, like our airplane did, they would have had that individual there. Um, but of course, up front, we have the, you know, the, the bomber's compartment, if you will, then the pilot's compartment. And these are separated by, uh, well, there's no bulkhead here, really, but um, these are separated by bulkheads. Behind the pilots in wartime, the navigator and radio man's compartment, of course, that doesn't exist anymore. Uh, we have some bench seats and things in here that you'll see. Uh, back here was the flight engineer, compartment D, the, the, what we call the tower in the airplane. This is where the landing gear is located as well. And in wartime, uh, after the flight engineer, you had what we call the living quarters. They actually had um, a little galley in here, that, like it was janitorial type fire, like a janitorial heater for heat that used aviation fuel from you know the right right main tank there. Um, back in the waste gunners compartment, and if you were doing search and rescue, which they called Dumbo missions in World War II, this is where these individuals would be pulled on board the airplane through a blister. You saw in that one photo how low the airplane sits in the water. So it was relatively easy to do, so to speak. And then back here, we call this the tunnel compartment. And there was actually a, a, a ventral compartment, if you will. But there was, there was a hatch here that uh, is hinged aft and lifts up here with a 30 caliber gun mount. And you can actually place a 30 caliber. I don't know how effective this would have been in wartime, but you can actually shoot below the airplane with a 30 caliber gun. So that was kind of it. It was generally 10 people. And we'll kind of take a look at the airplane. These are John's picture. Now you're looking actually between the rudder paddles, which you can see on either side of the picture there. And you're looking into the, into the bow of the airplane. And there's the forward window here where you'd aim through. This is the upper turret that you see as well. Um, all this is original in here. It's painted white, but it is original. Uh, John's working on all that as literally as we speak. If we move back, and, and if you look right here, this is how you get up there. You have to crawl over this little uh, hump right here where the nose wheel goes uh, up into this area here. Um, crews generally did not like the Enfib airplanes because they had a lot less room inside them. You know, this is a good example. You didn't have all this. Um, they had a lot more room in a straight flying boat. Uh, and some of them, uh, pilots that I've spoke to, and I'll, th I'll mention one here in a moment, they never even flew an amphib. You know, they'd spend their whole career just flying a straight, uh, straight, you know, PBY-5 uh, in combat. And that was the last they ever flew the PBY. There's a good shot of the cockpit and the hangar over at the museum there. Um, one interesting thing I'll note here, and you saw a cockpit, picture earlier because it's a little broader view. Um, but over here, this is a rudder lock. It's stowed right now. Uh, this can be extended and the rudder can literally be locked. There's a telescoping pin that comes out of a closing rib and a horizontal stabilizer in the leading edge of the rudder. And that is our quote unquote gust lock. It's a large surface area that's easily affected by wind. And if you have very strong surface winds and you're attempting to taxi, you can lock it and taxi that way as well. In taxiing the airplane, you're completely dependent upon differential braking to caster that nose wheel with some differential power. And it's certainly much more arduous to coax the airplane into a turn, particularly smoothly, uh, where historically unlocked, you'd be using a combination of, of rudder, throttle, and brake in order to caster that, that nose wheel. But that's a good view of the cockpit. So we went from the bow, now we're back to uh, compartment B here, the cockpit. We're going to go aft of the cockpit. And this is where the flight engineer, correction, excuse me, this is where the radio operator and the navigator resided in the airplane. And this bulkhead that you see here goes into the cockpit right here. And this is a watertight door. This is a, uh, a seat that's a folding seat. It's two seats, actually. It's a bench seat, if you will. Um, 
that's been modded and added to the airplane and, and John has that retracted here. We can raise and lower it as needed um, for additional seating in the airplane. Um, brake de-boosters and stuff are under these floor panels over here. And this bulkhead leads back into the flight engineer compartment. We'll head there. And this picture is literally taken from that door, that big open door you saw on the side. Flight engineer compartment, John is shooting up and aft here. Um, so the, the panel is forward of the seat that you see. You're looking behind the seat. Here's the two windows I mentioned that you can open. And the flight engineer literally had a view. He was sitting between the engines. <laughs> One of the best expressions I ever heard it was kind of funny. Uh, I was in a super cat, but long story short, there were some Navy P3 guys there and they were begging for a ride in the super cat. So we made that happen. And um, the pilot of the airplane sat in the seat, unbeknownst to me, in the super cab. And when we got back down on the ground, and now keep in mind, it's B-25 engines on that airplane. But when we got back on the ground, I said, well, how'd you enjoy the flight? And he said, well, when you brought those throttles up, I thought my teeth were going to come out. Um, and that's literally what it's like here in this seat. Now, sometimes, John, I think Bronner sits in that seat. Uh, since he is the crew chief, he's entitled. But um, I think he enjoys it up there. Uh, aft of that flight engineer compartment in the pylon there, this would have been the living quarters, if you will. And on one side, they had bunks, literally no, cots, if you will, like a bunk bed type arrangement. You can find pictures online. They had a galley right in here. I don't know how far we'll go on the restoration as far as putting that stuff in. I know they inevitably they would like to, but I think it would be kind of neat. The windows are mod, uh, obviously modded. The floor has been modded down here. That's not original floor. So we go back into the blister compartment here. This is original floor. John's been working in here. And here's where the blisters were. And there were a couple of seats in wartime where the gunners could sit against this bulkhead here. And the gun mounts were here. John, uh, tell us whether or not we got those mounts, but they're working on all that stuff now to actually put the 50s back in here, which I think will be pretty neat. Uh, and then this last bulkhead here goes back into that compartment B, the tunnel compartment I referred to it as. Might have another picture, but that hatch is literally right here. Um, let's see what I have. I do. And John has it open for us. So there's the hatch raise. It actually hinges aft and opens up. And right here is the mount that held the 30. So you would flip this thing down and, and literally point your 30 caliber out of this hatch. It doesn't look like you had too much of a, you know, a view field there to shoot with, but I guess they felt it was important to have it. So I, I don't know how effective it was. But anyway, and there's a couple other pictures of the same area back here in the blister compartment. Uh, looking forward to the airplane, you can see what it looks like there. Again, in the hangar, the blisters. These are two shells, an outer shell and an inner shell. And these inner shells rotate with this handle right here. You can just lift it up until it gets over center. Um, and then they simply are just, uh, they just pivot around two points, They're very simple. And they do lock, we can lock them. Oh, let's see, uh, I'm getting close to the very end here. I did want to mention, if, if you're, anyone's interested, these are some titles on YouTube I wrote that I'm very familiar with, 2015 Warbirds Over the Beach, where you can see the airplane flying, for example. Um, these are some pretty good ones, whoever shot those, I can't tell you who it was. But they're good. Um, they, they, they display the airplane well. Um, and I did want to mention too, and you can write this down, the, these, uh, these YouTube video titles. Uh, I did want to mention there was one Navy PBY pilot who won the Medal of Honor in combat. His name was Nathan Gordon. And most people aren't even aware of this. And I encourage you to look Nathan Gordon up. He was a gentleman's gentleman. And this painting here by Nicholas Trujian, uh, signed by uh, this Nathan Gordon signature right there. And this is a B-25 pilot by the name of Bill Cavoli. I knew both these gentlemen. Both, of course, have passed away. Um, but look up uh, Nathan Gordon and specifically his actions on February 15th, 1944. February 15th, 44 in a place in the South Pacific called Kaving Harbor. It's K-A-V-I-E-N-G, Kaving Harbor. It was a Japanese stronghold 
and the 345th Bomb Group, of which Bill Favoli was flying an airplane called Snafu. This depicts his airplane right here, only 600 yards offshore. Um, five B-25s are in the drink here, shot down as they made their 100 AGL strafing passes and fuel dumps were exploding, all kinds of stuff. Bill told me that a, a, literally a 55 gallon drum, if you will, of fuel exploded and came up and took his right engine right off um, of, this, of this fuel dump and he ditched the airplane. And these, the B-25 strafing airplanes would always go bow low like that because they had all those 50 calibers and all that ammunition. They were very head nose heavy. Um, all crew members got out. Nathan Gordon picked up five crews under fire and he had to shut down the PBY engines each time to pull crew members on board. Remember, a seaplane has no brakes in the water when the engines are running. So uh, for his actions that day, he was awarded the Medal of Honor. So I encourage you, look up Nathan Gordon, just a fine gentleman. Um, and uh, he passed away in 2008. And we actually flew a tribute show, Bob and I. Um, when we found out that he passed away, I got a phone call. But, uh, also, uh, PBY, if you're interested in Hollywood movies of the day, Wings of the Navy here, which has excellent footage of PBY 2s, which you see depicted here on the poster. Um, a lot of good wartime footage, Pensacola, N3Ns, you know, et cetera. Uh, another one that features a lot of uh, PBY shots, particularly interior shots, is High Barbary, a little bit more of a love story. But, um, but again, a PBY feast, you know, if you're into those airplanes. Anyway, um, that is all I have with the exception of, here's a list if you wish to write those down and some recommended reading if you want to know more about the PBY. Uh, Black Cat Raiders of World War II. Nathan Gordon was a Black Cat Raider, by the way. VP, VP 34 was his squadron. Um, and uh, that's an excellent book. Uh, and these guys talk about modifying PBYs. Um, there are pictures in there of twin 20 millimeter cannons poking out of the bow. I mean, they did all these modifications uh, that they would, you know, utilize and enhance their airplanes to, to attack Japanese shipping at night because the Japanese move most things at night across the water. Just incredible, hair raising tales, really incredible, incredible actions. But that's all I have. Uh, we are the Bobs. There we are. Uh, that's me on the left side with my holding my hat down in the wind, I guess. Um, I think uh, Rich, yeah, Rich Colazzo took that picture. He was up there. Um, so we are the Bobs, Bob Squared. And that's all I have. Uh, the, I will mention this Warbirds International magazine at the bottom here, an extensive uh, write up of the history of the museum's PBY. We did that shoot in, uh, I think it was August or July of 2011, whenever the show was that year. And we did, the, Michael O'Leary wrote that and did the photo shoot, but uh, an excellent account of the history of the airplane. So I encourage you to look up that, maybe you can find one on eBay or, or get a back issue or something. I only have one copy of myself. And I actually wrote a portion of that article in there. Uh, I entitled it From the Cockpit, kind of what it's like to fly the airplane. So I think he wanted 1,100 words. I'm going to give him 1,500 or something. But, but it's in there as well. And Keegan, that's that's all I have. Well, Bob, thank you so much for that. Uh, we definitely do have a lot of questions coming in. Um, we, I'm sure we all really appreciated basically having an opportunity to go through like a, a, a truncated version of a fan ground school tonight. So thank yeah. you for, for everything you've shared with us. Um, one of the questions that's come up quite a bit, Bob, is have you ever landed a PBY on the water? And is our airplane able to operate from the water? Oh, absolutely. Um, and yes, our airplane is able to operate off the water. We probably want to check a few things if we were to do that um, in, the, in the future. Um, that was broached many years ago, actually, with the museum's founder and myself. And quite honestly, in our area where we operate, uh, we either have salt water or brackish water. And if we look at the historical value of this airplane, and I also look at it from a custodial perspective. I am responsible for the airplane and I take it very seriously. Um, you know, it's probably, you'd have to hand detail the airplane every time you went in and out of even brackish water. I think it's too valuable a resource to be doing that, let alone the, uh, 
the exposure, if you will, uh, to other hazards. And you'd have to mitigate more risk, of course, operating on the water. But yes, I have had PBYs on the water. Um, not this one, and this one doesn't see water for, for the reasons I just mentioned. But yeah, I've had all those flying boats on the water, the Canadairs, obviously scooping loads, you know, fire, forest fires, um, Supercat, and um, the Albatross and the Mallard, all those things, and I have a lot of seaplane time as well. So, you know, beavers and super cubs and all the usual stuff that you find in, on the water. But, um, but hopefully that answers that question. You know, at 1.2 is also an insurance consideration for raised insurance, but the reality of it is, um, what would be the point? <laughs> you know, um, just so I could maintain water currency, I don't know if it's worth it. If I look at it as, as the, if I'm the owner of this airplane and I treat it that way, although I'm not, but I treat it that way, then I would not expose it to, to, to that risk, uh, not this airplane. It's a documented combat veteran. We have all those documents, all those log books. It certainly is a, a special airplane. Um, we've got a couple questions here about the the difference between the 5A, the 6A, the Super Cat. Um, mm -hmm. You kind of went into it a little bit, mentioned that the, the 6A had the taller tail and that the Super Cat has, has different engines. Can you mm -hmm. maybe talk about the, the history of those modifications and which ones were post-war versus wartime? Yeah, well, the 6A would have been a wartime um... Uh, design. Uh, I think the first flew, and, and you can look this up, but I think January 45 was the first flight. So I don't even know if it ever saw combat, to be, uh, to be honest with you. Uh, it would have entered, you know, relatively near the end of the war. It certainly used post-war, but the 6A was an effort to rectify all the, the, the flight handling characteristics primarily that I mentioned with the 5A. Yeah, it's a very ponderous airplane to fly. The 6A flies very nicely, actually, a lot easier. The Supercat, um, of course, um, all these airplanes wouldn't exist today. Well, in the case of the Amphib, if it wasn't an Amphib, it wouldn't exist at all as a straight flying boat. But they wouldn't exist unless these airplanes were sold civilian, and the civilians that purchased them put them into some type of useful purpose. Um, you know, flying, uh, the, you know, Catalinas were used to, to fly cargo, they were used to fly people, they literally used them airlines in Alaska and Canada and a lot of places. Um, and indeed, our airplane is certified under the old CARs, CAR 3, 4B. We can carry 19 passengers per certification. We can't per insurance, and we don't have the seating for that anyway. But, but these airplanes were utilized in that capacity. So they were put into some, they had some kind of useful purpose or they never would have survived. They made money for an operator, so to speak. The Super Cat was nothing more than an extension of that, depending on what you wanted to do with the airplane. Uh, forestry, for example. Uh, the Super Cat, and not all of them were used for forestry. Some were used for survey work, et cetera. Although uh, I don't know if I would have re-engined um, and flight planned 150 gallons an hour uh, just to get an extra, you know, 15, 20 knots on the airplane um, over a, a, a straight cat, if you will, with the 1830s. But if you're going to do some kind of load work, you know, scooping, you know, 1,000 to 1,500 gallons of water for the super cat, yeah, you'd want an additional 1,000 horsepower on the airframe. And of course, the, the triangular and taller vertical stabilizer was, was part of that um modification to handle that additional horsepower different propeller blades etc it had more rudder authority um so those were i call them working airplanes and that's that's the way to look at it uh, these airplanes are into living somewhere a lot of those were converted by various companies Stuart davis steward davis um in california was one of them you can probably look these things up online um, you know, certainly one of the loudest airplanes, you know, you, people think from a pilot perspective, B-25 is pretty loud. Um, in the Super Cat seems even worse because the propeller blades are probably about eight inches behind your head. So you get a lot of that tip speed there. 
you know, all these engines had the 23E50 hubs on them, which was a very common World War II propeller hub, Hamilton Standard Hub, Hydromatic Hub, but they all had different blades as well, depending on the configuration, what engine was utilized, et cetera. And all those, most of the gear reductions, um, I'll pick on the Super Cat. So, you know, all the gear reductions, well, even on this airplane with the 1830s, there are 16 to nine gear reductions. So they took the crankshaft speed of the engine, if you will, and gear reduced it to the propeller. And most of them were 16 to nine, which is almost two to one. 16 to eight would be a two to one ratio. So for example, when you read a tachometer in this cap and you're reading about to say 2000 RPM, your propellers are turning about half that value. It's about a thousand RPM on the propellers. And by having slower turning propellers by use of gear reduction on all these airplanes, you could run larger diameter propeller blades, which were um, more efficient and you didn't have the detrimental tip speeds that you would have with longer propeller blades. So the propeller was more efficient. The tips didn't tend to go supersonic, if you will, at higher RPMs. So they became you know, more efficient um, as well. So yeah, but those were working airplanes. And that's, that's the way I look at them. I mean, because I worked a lot of those airplanes, you know, <laughs> I mean, they made a living and that's how you made your living, so to speak. You know, whether you're hauling freight in the DC-3 or whatever, you didn't think of them as warbirds, so to speak, they were the tool you were using at the time. I think that's a really interesting point to make that the airplanes did survive on the basis of basically finding work after the war. It's why Stearmans are, are as plentiful as they are. They were really good aerial applicator platforms and they were cheap after the war. Uh, Bob, one of the interesting things uh, that, that characterizes the PBY is just this tremendous range that the airplane has, the enormous ability to just loiter and made it great for you know watching for enemy ships, conducting long range reconnaissance missions, hunting submarines. Uh, famously, after the fall of Singapore, PBYs were used to reconnect Australia with England uh, on a flight mm -hmm. that would last so long the sun would rise twice while the airplane was en route. Uh, yeah. which is tremendously amazing. Uh, you know, the Aleutians, uh, where the airplanes operated extensively in the Northern Pacific, was was known as the Thousand Mile War. Um, how do, how did they squeeze this kind of range out of the airplane? As as a pilot, are you looking at engine efficiency, fuel consumption? Obviously, the PBY is not a fast airplane, um, but but can you speak maybe to the, the the range and and just the ability to to be out there over the open ocean that this airplane had? Yeah, and range, of course, is, all, is also a function of headwind or tailwind component, too. I mean, that's reality. Um, but the ability to loiter endurance as opposed to range or to, that can be two different things. Typically, in wartime, they would cruise the airplanes at a very low RPM, uh, about 1,600 RPM. Uh, with, with the 1830-92, which is the wartime engine and the proper engine for our airplane as well. We actually have the documents that show those engines being installed, the, the 1830-92, about 12 days before that first test flight. I have those documents as well. Um, those, uh, those particular engines, you could probably get them down to the high 60s, you know, 60 gallons an hour type thing, sipping fuel. The that particular, the 6353 blades that are on these, coupled with the 2350 hub, um, you can in this engine you can go down to a minimum of 1300 RPM in flight. That's very slow turning. Uh, matter of fact, when we land the airplane, uh, I'll give it a little off topic, but the PBY has no flaps in an effort to um, allow the airplane to descend properly without increasing forward airspeed. When we're being the numbers, uh, the non-flying pilot will, will actually retard the RPM to about 1500. We pull them back to 1500 and that allows me to go to 18, 19 inches and set up a good sink rate because you don't want to reverse bearing load a radial engine. But, um, and of course, in wartime, they didn't care about that. But uh, so they're able to go relatively slowly. So they would typically cruise about 1600 RPM and be sipping fuel at you know, relatively low RPM settings. So the, generally in wartime, the, the wartime manuals show about 22 hours endurance on the normal fuel tanks we mentioned. Now, if you had 
additional bladder fuel inside, you know, the airplane that can be extended, for example. Uh, and you had the ability to potentially, even if you carried fuel on board, if you could set it in the water somewhere to transfer that fuel into the tanks. So, you know, you, you had the, the additional ability of the hull in relation to, in this case, with an amphib, the gear. Um, to place the airplane somewhere, but typically 22 hours was the endurance of the airplane in those settings. I hope that answers the question. I think that it does. Uh, Bob, John, John has been trying to join us and has been working on his microphone. John, Just. can you hear me? I hear can that. Can you hear me? Yeah, hi, John. Yeah, we hear you. Hello. Hey, hey John. So uh, for everyone who doesn't know, John is uh, an employee down at the fighter factory. He's got a special love for the PBY and has been uh, basically taking on the challenge of returning our post-war civilian interior airplane to a wartime configuration, uh, starting kind of tail first. John, there's a couple of questions here that I think as, a, as the engineer on the airplane may be well suited to you. Um, we, we had Kermit Weeks on and he talked about his Sunderland and there was a kind of an interesting feature he mentioned where there were deployable steps from the leading edge of the wing that allowed mechanics to get down and service the engines. Um, is there something like that on the PBY? Yes, there's actually a scaffolding that uh, comes with the aircraft and it goes on each side of the engine. Uh, so you can go up on the wing and then descend and sit next to the engine and get to all the accessories in front of the case and everything else. And I, I guess I didn't uh, send Bob a picture of that, but I do have a picture of that somewhere. I think they may have actually been laying inside the airplane on the floorboards in, in one of the pictures. Uh, another question here for the engineer, um, the controls at the engineering station, um, are they there? Are they cosmetic? Do they work? Are there, are there still gauges and indicators up in the pylon? Uh, everything up there um, is just for show right now. Uh, eventually, we're going to try and get at least a partial working panel up there. I doubt the levers and stuff will get moved there, but um, the rest of the panel is going to be, be put back in there some at some point. I think it's great to, to, to understand that these airplanes are, you know, complex multi-year projects to, to restore these things. Um, even the exercise of finding the bunks to put back in the airplane uh, was a challenge. John, can you talk a little bit about some of the parts that have been able to be located to to redo the interior yes um bob earlier was talking about some seats in the back uh near the blisters uh, and we actually have found um two of them uh one was installed at some point the other is a brand new nos has never been drilled uh seat that i'm going to put in at some point uh hopefully soon uh that we are we're in the process of also figuring out how to make the bunks so we will have the one side that's open in the back um the bunks actually go back in uh so we can actually have hanging bunks and you know a place for me to rack out while we're on long flights there's no such thing as time to rack out when flying a warbird uh, this this question may be for bob uh bob the airplane is really slow um you know all joking aside, uh, the other John from the fighter factory beat us up to Culpepper in a pickup truck. Um, you know, we left a little later than he did. And, and yes, the airplane is technically faster than the truck. But uh, most of the speed expressions this evening have been in knots, uh, which is, is well and good for the pilots and, and maybe folks among us. But for some of our, our, our general public audience, can you provide um, a kind of frame of reference in terms of miles per hour uh, for sure. PBY operation? Yeah, you know, if we look at wartime too, of course, you know, ships were always in knots, still are. And um, Navy airplanes of the period are all in knots. But if you look at the Army Air Corps airplanes, you know, B-25 or B-17, for example, they're all in miles. Um, and then we didn't go to a standard of knots really in most of aviation until about the mid 70s, as I recall, but <clears throat> I date myself. But um, and then knots became the standard. So even in the Cessnas and Pipers and things, you saw variation, you know, of, of uh, different airspeed indicators. And many of them have both on there as well. But um, think of an, uh, a mile an hour is 15 percent, or a knot is being 15 percent faster. So, for example, 
Um, 100 knots is 115 miles an hour. 200 knots is 230. You know, 250 knots is 288 miles an hour, uh, for example. Um, so 250 knots below 10,000 feet, you know, in a jet, for example, that's our speed limit. Um, below 10,000, we have a speed limit of 250 knots. Most, unless you're a pilot, you probably don't know that. Uh, above 10,000, you know, uh, don't break the sound barrier. But um, so hopefully that, that's an indication, 15%, 100 knots, 115 miles an hour, 200 knots is the, you know, equivalent of 230, 250 knots is 288 miles an hour. Well, that's uh, that's great to know that. A um, couple more questions for you, Bob, and then we'll have another for John. Um, you mentioned the airplane flew 19 hours from San Diego out here. Um, did it likely have ferry tanks fitted, and uh, was there an autopilot on board the wartime airplanes? 19.2, and yes, they did have an autopilot, and that was uh, very valued in the PUI, particularly on those long patrols. Um, we do not have an autopilot. Of course, we don't fly 22 hours. Uh, I don't know if the airplane had any kind of um, auxiliary tanks. I would tend to think it did not. You know, it went on its uh, normal, because it could, it could easily reach 22 hours. Um, and, you know, they always had the option if, they, if fuel was going to be a concern of landing and refueling. I think if people are curious why there was a kitchenette on board, the 22-hour uh, flight would probably uh, clarify that for everyone. Um, yeah. We'll go ahead and, and John, uh, we got a question for you here. Uh, how do you pull the props through uh, when they're so high up in the air? Uh, normally you don't. You usually use the starter to bump them through. Um, mm -hmm. Honestly, there was, hasn't been a lot of uh, hydro locks on the PBY that I've ever witnessed. So it's usually just to bump it through and if there's a lock, then we'll figure it out. But usually there's not a lock, so. Yeah, but any of the flying boats, like John mentioned, you, you tend to bump through one blade at a time, being careful not to develop any blade inertia. Um, in as much as you, uh, on a, if you're hand pulling on those airplanes that you can on the surface, you know, 17s or 25s, whatever, you know, you pull them by hand, you're, you're trying to approximate that bumping the starter. There's no way you can lay on that in the cell and grab a prop shank and, and pull it through by hand. It's impossible. So, Bob, I think this is probably a question for you. Um, does the, the narrow track of the engines make single engine operation easier than it is, say, in an airplane like the B-25, where the engines are further apart, separated by the fuselage? Yes, aerodynamically speaking. Performance speaking, mm, the cat's fairly marginal on a single engine, depending on how it's loaded. You know, you if we, uh, at, our, at our current max takeoff weight, and particularly our, our center of gravity envelope. The most fuel we can put on this airplane is 1,082 gallons. And we've done 1,000 gallons several times tankering fuel over the years. And the performance difference is, uh, is incredibly noticeable. Um, how slow the airplane accelerates down the runway, you know, for departure, for example. But yeah, and, and as you add fuel in a PBY, the CG moves aft, and hence that's when we hit our aft limit at, at, 10, at 1082 on the gallons. So tankering fuel, one has to be careful, and if you're managing risk with potential engine failure, and you always have to think that way, um, obviously the lighter the airplane, the better performance you're going to have out of the airplane. Um, it's, you know, the pilots are out there, it's published. VMC speed, if you will, ranges depending on weight between 76 and 80 knots, basically. That single engine uh, best rate of climb speed is 87 knots, where its normal rate of climb speed is 90 knots. Um, so it's a very three knot window there, uh, you know, relatively, um, relatively small window. I always go for performance. Uh, if I had the choice, but we have tankered fuel like that and the airplane behaves very, very differently. You know, many airplanes do though, but B-17, you, you get a B-17 up over 1,200 gallons and hold 1,700 without the Tokyo tanks, for example. It, it becomes a different flying airplane. 
So, I mean, it's, that's not um, singularly applied to just the PBY. That could be any machine, if you will. But, so, but in the PBY, when you add fuel, the CG is moving aft. As you burn fuel, the CG moves rather forward. So, um, you know, you're always mindful of these types of things uh, for performance planning and risk management. We've got a couple questions that have come in about the different turret positions on the airplane. Obviously, we talked a lot about the the stinger gun under the tail, um, the blisters aft, you know, mounted mounted guns back there. But were also the principal way that you pulled people into the airplane on a rescue mission and things like that. Um, the the nose turret that's on our airplane, it, it was modified to the eyeball turret that's correct for that airplane during the period of the war that it saw service. Does that turret retract? to allow the handling of mooring gear in the way that you see, say, in a, in a Royal Air Force Sunderland. Do you want to handle that, John, or shall I? Uh, you can if you'd like. Yeah, no, they don't retract at all. Now, there is a hatch on the upper portion of the turret you can open and, and literally pop out through the, the top of the turret. And if you, if you find some wartime photos, you can actually see people, you know, the upper portion of their body extended out of the turret, if you will. Uh, I think that's that's a great piece of information for us all to have. Uh, folks, it, it is getting late. We are drawing to the end of the question and answer portion here. Um, you will have the opportunity to see the PBY fly this year. Uh, the summer of flight schedule has been posted and you can visit our website to see the PBY scheduled appearances. Um, and hopefully we will have the Bobs out here to fly it at some point this year, um, which will give you an opportunity to, to, to meet the Bobs out on the flight line here at the museum. Uh, the replay, uh, or recording of this webinar will be made available through the webinar archive on the Military Aviation Museum website. It will take a couple of weeks to get it up there. Uh, we do have a bit of a backlog at the moment created by the pace at which we've been producing these webinars. Uh, so we want to thank everyone for, for being here with us tonight. Thank you to the audience, but also thank you to Bob and to John Bronner for, for joining in. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you again, everyone. Have a great evening.